I'll keep using this and hopefully that will help out. All right, we'll open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2 this evening. I'll turn the map back on here and this time I'm going to try not to turn it off. Uh, use the on off button as a pointer. I think it's on. Yeah. I like having maps so I can see things and get a better feel for uh, what it must have been like. And We're looking at the seven churches of Asia in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. And uh, We looked at the first church, the, the church in Ephesus, and I'd like to move on this evening and speak about the next church, the, uh, the church of Smyrna. Now this isn't Smyrna, Georgia. This is Smyrna that would be in Turkey. We're talking about in Asia and most of these are found in modern-day Turkey. I think all of them are. And uh, again, my point uh, or my, my focus as we go through this is not to look at this prophetically, although there is room and, and application to this in a prophetic sense. I want to just look at it from the simple point of view of uh, we're looking at a church and the instruction of Jesus Christ to this church. We know this is a message Directly, all the messages are directly from Jesus Christ, given to John to give to the, the angel of the, uh, of the church or, or the pastor of the church, the messenger. And so I, I'd like to just look at these from the point of view of church instruction and things that we can glean as a church and understand in our own church life and, and, and purpose and mission. This church in Smyrna is about 35 miles roughly north of Ephesus. So if you look on the map there, and this is the one with the pointer, and there it is. So there we saw uh, Ephesus here, and Smyrna is on the seacoast. It's in a port area, so it's kind of protected, just a little bit north of Ephesus. So it uh, the gospel seemed to radiate out of Ephesus while Paul was in Ephesus teaching there uh, for about two years. It seemed to radiate, near as we can tell, out of Ephesus into a this area of Asia on Paul's third missionary journey. On his second missionary journey, you'll remember he was forbidden of the Holy Spirit. Somewhere here. Forbidden of the Holy Spirit to go down into Asia or up into Bithynia. And so he went across into Troas, and then on over to Philippi, and then came in got ma and hit Macedonia and Achaia, stopped off in Ephesus just briefly, but then sailed on back into Antioch and Jerusalem. And the third missionary journey, he was able to go down into Asia and into Ephesus. We don't know exactly when this church in Smyrna was founded. 
who was the original one that, that went in and started preaching the gospel there. We're not really sure. But uh, it, the Holy Spirit, uh, the Lord addresses, our Lord Jesus Christ addresses specifically this church. It uh, had been there for some time. As far as we know, uh, that we have some history of this period, some uh, regular secular history, if you will. There was a strong Jewish population in the city. And... Um, most everywhere that there was a strong Jewish population in the city, there was strong Jewish opposition to the gospel. So we can pretty well assume there was opposition from the Jewish sector here. There was also a very strong Roman loyalty. Evidently, uh, history records that Smyrna was a regional headquarters of the cult of emperor worship. And so, in other words, when a Caesar would be in power in Rome... Uh, there was a group of people, primarily, even uh, there would even be decrees, as uh, happened uh, not too long after this was written, decrees made in which one must vow allegiance to the Caesar as God and disavow any other allegiances as God. And so... There's, so we see two factions at work in this city, in Smyrna, that would be in opposition to the Christians. The Christians who uh, were teaching something other than the Jewish traditions. They were teaching Christ as the Messiah, and the Jews primarily in a lot of these cities were uh, opposing that. And also, they would not um, vouch loyalty to Caesar, uh, as far as God. Loyalty as citizens, certainly, but not as God. They would not worship him as God. So there was uh, opposition by both the Jews and the Romans. And I'm reminded of a verse in Luke uh, chapter 23 and verse 12, as Jesus was being questioned and uh, as they on, on the, the hours leading up to his crucifixion, we read, And the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. And so there was a common unifying bond between Pilate and Herod in opposition to Jesus Christ. And I can see the same kind of unifying force at work here in Smyrna against, uh, against the church. So let's begin reading here in Revelation chapter 2. And verse 8, Revelation 2, 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those, which thou sh those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Now out of the seven... Uh, messages to these seven churches, there are two that, that don't possess negative aspects. Remember last week we read in the, about the church of Ephesus, the Lord said, I have somewhat against thee. We don't see that here with the church in Smyrna. We also don't see it with the church in Philadelphia. So this is absolutely a positive message except for the fact that the Lord said, you will suffer persecution. You'll, you'll, you'll suffer uh, um Tribulation, ten days, and Satan will cast some of you into prison. So Jesus begins his message to this church by this introduction, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. First and last, I'm reminded of his title, Alpha and Omega, and telling us that he is eternal. 
And he's above all. The first and the last. That which is dead and is alive. And so he's introducing himself to them or he's giving his, this salutation to them. This, that which is eternal and that which is a risen Savior. Who, one who has power over death and over hell. That's a comforting thought. When, to know that our Lord, the one who guides us in our church, is eternal. He has power over death. He's the Alpha and Omega and the one that uh, is, was dead and is alive. We serve a risen Savior, a God that is alive. And in verse 9 he says, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So again, he, after his salutation, he says, I know your situation. I know the troubles that you have. I know your, your works. The, the word works here can, is also translated toils. I know your toils. I know the, the troubles you've been having and the, 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 the toils of your life. When we have toils, it's a comfort to know that our Savior understands. He's, he has been tempted in all points like as we have. He knows and understands. He sees any troubles that we're having. He sees any anguish of heart. He sees any suffering. And He's there to comfort. He said, I know your works. And tribulation and poverty. There was much evil in Smyrna. And the people there hated the Christians. We know that their first pastor was a disciple of the Apostle John. His name was Polycarp. He was one of the disciples of the Apostle John. He was the first pastor of the church in Smyrna. He was burned at the stake in AD, roughly AD 155 as an old man. He was about 90 some years old. Uh, refused to... Um, uh, recant, if you will, his uh, refused to deny Jesus Christ and proclaim Caesar as God. And so he was taken out and burned at the stake. It's, it is said of him in Armitage's history of the Baptists that um, when they went to bind him, he said, you don't need to. My Lord will keep me there. My love for the Lord, he said, will keep me there on the, on the, uh, the stake. So they just uh, he stood there, and as they burned him, he stood there and proclaimed his love of the Lord until the, uh, someone, the flames wouldn't touch him and were burning all around him. And finally somebody uh, uh, pierced him through with a spear and killed him there. Polycarp. Uh, he also has some writings that are interesting to read. But he was their first pastor who... It's indicative of the kind of hatred that the people there had for the, for the church in Smyrna. That he was burned at the, at the stake. Jesus in his message to them did not promise to take away their suffering. He said in verse 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. He didn't say he'd take their troubles away. He said, fear none of those things. He said, don't fear it. And then he gives them a commission, be thou faithful unto death. And I'll give thee a crown of, the, the crown of life. Be thou faithful unto death. Don't believe all those who tell you that Jesus will take away all your troubles. There are too many witnesses throughout history to, to, to prove that otherwise. But he does promise the crown of life. He does say, don't fear those who can kill the body. When we are required to suffer, though, we know that our Lord will hold out to us both in encouragement and hope. He said, fear not, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. No need for them to, to fear that. Go through and do the work, 
Stand in the place, be faithful, be faithful unto death. The Lord calls all of us to the same kind of faithfulness, even though we may not have to suffer persecution to the point of uh, anguish of body or, or imprisonment or even death. But the Lord holds out the same promises for us and the same command. Be faithful. Be faithful unto death, and you, thou shalt receive the crown of life. The Lord said that he knew their poverty. In verse 9, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. And I find that odd because if you look at the, the Bible references about Smyrna, they go into the geographic location, the politics of it, and then they go into the fact that Smyrna was a port city surrounded by very fertile farmlands. And in a lot of ways it reminds me of Corinth and the same sort of thing. Now a port city where you've got access to trade so you can import and export and you have fertile farmlands all around so especially you can export and sell. It's a very wealthy city. And in fact the archaeologists have uh, uncovered uh, marvelous uh, archaeological uh, remains there of buildings and and. and uh, streets that are lined with tall columns uh, as you walk through. This was a rich town. But the church people there were poor. Their poverty. But the Lord says, but thou art rich. So they had a poverty, an affliction of poverty in the flesh, but spiritually they were rich, the Lord said. They had the true riches, as it says in Luke 16, 11, If ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? The folks in this church had the true riches. This is a stark contrast to the church in Laodicea. Look at, let's go to chapter 3 and look ahead to the message that the Lord gave to the church in Laodicea in verses 17 and 18 of chapter 3. In Laodicea, they said, or the Lord said to the church, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that, they, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. This church in Laodicea said, well, we're rich. We're increased with goods. And yet they, they said, we have need of nothing. The church in Smyrna suffered with poverty. And the Lord didn't have anything against them. It's not always directly related, but it's usually the case that material wealth hinders spiritual growth. Let's go to Luke 18, verses 18 through 27. Who'd like to read that? Luke 18, verses 18 through 27. Anybody like to volunteer? Oh, Brother Paul, thank you. Okay, go ahead. 18, 18 through 27? Yes. A certain ruler asked him, saying, Good Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest me good? None is good, save one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these things have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute it unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the needle's eye than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? And he said, the things which are impossible with the earth are possible with God. Amen. Thank you. So this uh, rich ruler 
wanted to know about eternal life, and the Lord knew exactly where this man's heart was. He said, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And, he said, and the Lord recited these commandments, the particular commandments related to uh, our relationship with one another. And he said, well, I've done all of that. And then he said, well, this, this thou lackest. Go and sell all that you have. This man's God was his riches. It hindered his spiritual relationship. It hindered his relationship with God. It prevented his true relationship with God. This, is a, uh, uh, this would be similar to what the, where the Laodiceans were. However, the church in Smyrna had the true riches. The Lord said, thou art rich. They were poor in material goods, but they were rich in their relationship with the Lord. It's often the case that material wealth impedes our relationship with God. The, the deciding factor is if we have the proper heart or the proper attitude towards God and towards riches. And we've been studying that in our Navigating Finances class, uh, getting to that understanding of it all belongs to God, and it's His. We are stewards of it. And it's in His power to raise up or to grant riches or to, uh, that we should be in poverty, such as this church in Smyrna. But they had works, and they had tribulation, they had poverty, but they were rich nonetheless. I think this is indicative of, of the, the spirit and the heart of this church and the fact that the Lord had nothing against them. They were rich in the, the, in the true riches. They had a love for God and a love for one another. But yet, in the midst of all of that, even though this is such a good church, the Lord allowed them to suffer. Why would the Lord allow them to suffer so severely if He had nothing against them? If He wasn't uh, telling them they needed to repent and He said, you're rich. He had a purpose for them. He had a testimony for them to maintain in that town. And Sometimes the Lord calls us to this, this kind of a calling. It may be that we have to suffer on this earth. There was a particular aspect of their suffering that I find pretty interesting in verse 9. He said, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Again, let's go to chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 9. We see this same thing repeated uh, to the church in Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia is the other church in which the Lord didn't have uh, anything against them. He didn't state anything against them. Chapter 3 and verse 9, he said, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. A couple of interesting things about this. In Jesus Christ, Jew and Gentile are made one. There's no difference. So why would it be important for people to come to the church and say, we are Jews who are not? What is he talking about? Well, this, uh, it seems to be, and, and most every commentator I read after this had a different opinion, but it seems to be there were those that, that were uh, using the title as Jewish who were Judaizers, like in many of the other churches where the Apostle Paul and Peter and John were Judaizers that were coming in and saying, unless you are circumcised or unless you do the uh, works of the law, you can't be saved. In other words, saying, no, it's not by faith in Jesus Christ, it's by the works of the law. Saying that they're Jews, boasting of their Jewish origin, magnifying the Jewish traditions over the word of God. We know that this was a powerful force of opposition in the early churches. Save your place here and let's go to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 and verses 28 and 29. The scripture says, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. 
Speaking of those who uh, judged others according to the law and punished others, but overlooked grace, overlooked that which Jesus Christ gives us, salvation through faith, not by works. The Apostle Paul said when he wrote to the Romans, that's, one might say they're a Jew, but they're not, because they're, they're, they may be Jewish on the outside in their law, but Jewish on the heart means one that would do the works of God, a man of faith, a person who, who is uh, uh, of the called, called out people. And we know later on there in Romans that uh, Paul says, God hath made of the two one, brought Jew and Gentile together. So this is my opinion on this, and what I think of it is that uh, both Philadelphia and Smyrna were dealing with these Judaizers who were coming in, trying to convert everybody to the traditions of men, get them out of the church, cause division, saying they're Jews, but not like as God would call them a Jew, a person who is a person of faith, one that is grafted in uh, to the lineage of faith and not, uh, uh, not uh, promoting works, but rather promoting faith. That's what God would call a, uh, one who is uh, uh, of Jewish in heart. The Lord said, they say they're Jews, but they're not, but are the synagogue of Satan. We see that term over there again in uh, Revelation 3, 9, too. He says, Behold, I'll make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Of the synagogue of Satan. Interesting. What, what does synagogue mean? This, this, this is the first time I've ever thought of this as I was doing this study. A thought came to me that I'd never had before. What is a synagogue? Any ideas? What do you think a synagogue is? Pardon? A congregation. That's exactly what the word synagogue means, an assembly. So now let me ask a question. These people who say they're Jews but they're not are identified with the assembly, congregation of Satan. Why didn't the Lord choose to build his synagogue? Why are we not called Badger Road Baptist Synagogue? Why did the Lord choose to use the Greek word ekklesia for an assembly, meaning a legal assembly or a called out town assembly, as opposed to a religious assembly, commonly known already in common practice among the Jews? Why did, why did he choose to use synagogue here and not use synagogue everywhere else in the New Testament when he was talking about his church? It, it, synagogue more closely fits what we do. Our pattern of worship it looks very similar to the old synagogue form of worship where we get up, we read scriptures, we sing songs. Very similar. That's a curious question. Has anybody else had that thought? Why, why, are, why did the Lord choose to use the Greek word ekklesia over the word synagogue when he built up his church? And why is ekklesia used so many times and synagogue is used here only in relation to the Jews? Any theories, ideas? <laughs> right. Okay. The, the synagogue was a religious assembly, not necessarily a called out assembly. It's a good point. I was thinking also it might have to do with the fact that the Lord used a more Gentile term for his church as opposed to a, a Jewish term as well, showing that his, church, now his churches are now Jew and Gentile. This is the age of the Gentiles. The church age is this age of the Gentiles. And so, I don't know. There, there could be other answers as well. That's it's just the idea that came into my mind. But I just thought that was curious. These are called of the synagogue of Satan. And so in very negative terms, he says, they say they're Jews, they're not, but they're of the, and he uses the Jewish term for assembly, they're of the, the Jewish assembly of Satan. 
That's some pretty hard language against these people. They are of the synagogue of Satan. Those that would deny Jesus Christ or Antichrist were taught elsewhere in the scriptures. Those that deny that Jesus is the Christ, that's the spirit of Antichrist. And here we see this whole idea related to those saying they're Jews and are not. They are of the synagogue of Satan, the assembly of Satan. And he said that... Um, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. It was blasphemous for them to be claiming to be the people of God, but living a way that is opposed to His Spirit. That's blasphemy. And that applies generally. That's what blasphemy is, is opposing God and speaking out in as, uh, uh, opposition to God. Claiming to be the people of God but having a message and, and a, a life that's in opposition to God. They were blasphemous for, for being that way. It was a blasphemy. These are the sorts that the church in Smyrna was having to deal with. Can you imagine what it would be like, what church -like life would be like in the assembly when there are people that were constantly coming in saying that they were of the people of God but it was evident that they were not, and they're causing trouble all the time. Um, I can uh, the, the illustration that comes to my mind is that uh, what what would that do to the personality of the church? What would that do to the to the membership of that body? They didn't have the written word of God compiled in the canon that we have here. They had various writings from the apostles that had been distributed. It was, it was coming together. But you know what they would do? They had a lot of spurious writings that were coming in, writings that were definitely false, and people claiming, this is the word of God. I saw it in a vision. That would cause a church to be very much on the defensive, constantly. Constantly wary of false teachers, false writings, false professors. I see this, this had to have been an extremely serious-minded church. They were not going to tolerate lies and hypocrisy, false doctrine, anything that went contrary to what they had been taught, they weren't going to tolerate it. I'm, I'm, the illustration that, that comes to my mind is that of a, um, a warrior, a soldier who's been on the battlefield they are one who's been on the battlefield and experienced becomes hardened. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. I mean that they become very experienced, very alert, very much aware of what can happen. And through training and through experience, develops a very keen sense of defense and awareness. And I think this church in Smyrna had to have been a church like that. They had this tribulation around them everywhere they went. It was interesting to me that when we lived over in Russia, those uh, Russian Baptists that had lived over there, and I understand, they were, they, and you understand, I believe, that they were, uh, they didn't believe exactly what, like we did. They had a lot of the old English Baptist uh, ideas, uh, very much Armenian and very, very much uh, they believed you could lose your salvation, this sort of thing. But it was interesting to me that those that were in the underground churches were extremely wary. When they walked to assembly and they met in apartments uh, and they would rotate in different people's apartments as to where they would meet because if they got caught, they'd be fined or imprisoned during the Soviet era. So they watched who was following them. And when they came into assembly, they, if there was somebody new, that person needed to be identified before things would proceed. In other words, before they would begin having their meeting, who is this person? Who can vouch for this person? How do we know they're not a spy from the KGB? Can you imagine going to assembly like that every time? Every time we gathered here, looking around and saying, is that person here to spy us out and get us arrested? It would make for a little bit different atmosphere, wouldn't it? And this church in Smyrna had to have been very much like that. Looking around, and, and you know, 
We want to bring guests. We want to bring people in to hear the word. And, and the church, churches over there in Russia were no different. I had the privilege of going to some of their, their meetings, and they were very warm people, but at the same time, um, you could tell they had been used to being wary. And the first time their pastor came to one of our meetings, he was so wary about us that he just kind of stood in the corner and watched everything. We would say hello, and he just kind of nod like that. Wasn't going to talk. After a couple of uh, uh, times that he came to us, he made our interpreters extremely nervous. Uh, they didn't know who this guy was. Finally, he introduced himself and very slowly began to reveal who he was, and it became pretty apparent to me, at least, to why he behaved the way he did. He had been conditioned to behave that way. Very much different than what we are used to here in America. Very different. But yet I see in this, I can understand a little bit of why they were rich. They had to be very diligent about the Word of God. They had to be very diligent about their fellowship. They had to be very protective of one another in their church. The Lord said, I know your tribulations, your works, your poverty, but thou art rich. He knew the blasphemy of those that were coming around them who were deceivers. And in verse 10 he said, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. This is, this is, this is a promise of future suffering. He said, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. He said, They'd be cast into prison that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. I'm not sure exactly what that 10 days are. There could be some different uh, interpretations to that. He shall have tribulation 10 days. I think this is, we'd get more into this if we were looking more into the prophetic side of, the, uh, of these messages. But they, will, they were to have tribulation for a space of time. He said, be thou faithful unto death. This is kind of a conditional promise. He says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. This is sort of an if-then statement. If thou art faithful unto death, I'll give you a crown of life. This faithful unto death brings this crown of life. This is promised. Jesus Christ made this promise. I'll give you this crown of life the first and the last, the one that's dead and the one that's risen, he says, I'll give you a crown of life. He's risen. He can give a crown of life. He has that power. Now you suppose this is a crown is to be understood as eternal life? Or is this crown of life a, uh, a reward in heaven? If I remember right, the Russian Baptists believe that this is referring to eternal life. If you're faithful, if you're faithful unto death, and if you don't um, abandon the faith, then you will be given eternal life. If you do profess Jesus Christ and then later on sin and depart from the faith, then eternal life will be taken away from you. That's their interpretation. My understanding of this is those that are saved will be faithful unto eternal life, and those that aren't faithful excuse me, faithful unto death. Those that aren't faithful unto death just prove they never were saved. That's my understanding of this. But I think this has to do with rewards. Let's look at James chapter 1 and verse 12. James chapter 1 and verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So there's a crown. If we will endure temptation, if we'll be faithful unto death, there is a crown that the Lord will give. And I believe it, it, is, it involves rewards, obviously as well as just salvation. And he says in verse 11, 
He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 5 and verses 4 and 5. 1 John chapter 5 and verses 4 and 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. The Lord said, He that overcometh to the uh, church in Smyrna, he that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. And so how do we overcome? This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So the Lord told the church in Smyrna that uh, if, if we overcome, the second death has no power. So what's the first death and what's the second death? Well, the first death obviously is our, our departure from this world, the separation of body and soul. The second death is when all, all the, the spirits of everybody are gathered again, judged before God and those... Uh, the, uh, uh, all unbelievers are cast into the lake of fire for eternity. And that place uh, reserved for Satan and his angels. Let's go to Revelation 20 and verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. How do we overcome? We overcome by faith. What happens if we overcome? The second death has no power over us. The only death that has power over us is when this body is separated from our soul. Then, if we've overcome by faith in Jesus Christ, that's our means of overcoming. Then, we have the promise of the inheritance, and that is a glorified body to live eternally with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to Revelation 21 and verse 8. Revelation 21 and verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The Lord, when He spoke, our Lord Jesus Christ, the first and the last, the one that's dead and the one that is alive, He looked at this church and He said, I know what you're suffering, but you're rich. And I know that you've got deceivers among you that are of the synagogue of Satan. But he says, if you'll overcome, be faithful unto death, if you'll overcome, the second death will have no, no part over you, no power over you. You'll not have to endure that. No promise to be relieved of their persecution, their troubles, but a great hope. And he qualified that as he spoke to him. He says, I'm the, I'm the first and the last. I'm the, the, uh, the one that's, that was dead and am alive. And if you'll overcome, you'll be with me, basically is what he was saying. Second death will have no power over you. This church in Smyrna was a uh, suffering church, but yet a rich church. And I, I think... If we want to be rich here in this church, we have to come to, and I don't mean material rich, I mean spiritually rich, with a close, very close walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and with power in our lives to endure any persecutions, troubles, tribulations, to have wisdom in the Lord and to, uh, 
to, to rejoice and to be thankful and to be fruitful in our labors for him. We need that spiritual richness like the church in Smyrna had. They were called upon to endure tribulation, and we may be called upon, who knows, as well at some time, all that live in godly in Jesus Christ shall suffer persecution, we're told. I think the lesson for us here is to desire that spiritual richness and to uh, eliminate those things that would, would stand in the way of that spiritual richness, to seek after that richness, no matter what, and to hold on to what they were uh, told, be faithful unto death. No matter what, no matter what our lot is, be faithful. Continue on in our faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to abandon it, not to get sidetracked, not to get discouraged, but just continue on in our faithfulness, not to compromise, not to put down the Word of God, but to keep always holding it up as our standard and our banner and our guide and our light for our lives and our message to the world. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer and then we'll go into our, our song service. So praise the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this vision of Jesus Christ that's presented to us in your holy word. Thank you, Lord, for this message. And Lord, we thank you for the saints that endured there in Smyrna. And we know, Lord, that you're just and true and that those dear saints who are faithful indeed are there with you. Father, their souls are preserved for eternity. And Lord, that we here even now have the same promise that they do, the same promise of eternal life, O gracious God. Lord, we know that we shall be gathered together in one in heaven. Lord, gathered together, praising the Savior, our Savior Jesus Christ, praising your holy name, O God. Lord, we just ask that you might help us here to maintain the truth of your word in our lives and in our congregation, in our testimony, in our families. Lord, to be the light that you would have us to be, to be faithful unto your word and not compromise it. Lord, I ask that you would bless this church and help us, O God, to have that faithfulness. Lord, help us to endure the things that we may have to endure. Lord, even those things which may come from within or come from without, wherever they may be, wherever Satan gets a wedge and tries to drive it in our midst, Lord, may we be faithful. May we be faithful both to your word and to your spirit, to the example that you've given us through, through our Savior Jesus Christ and through the churches and saints that have gone on before us, O oh Lord. May we have that faithfulness and that true richness in this body. Lord, may we ever maintain it. I praise you, Lord, for this church and for the way that you've blessed us in so many ways. Father, for the good teaching that has come down to us from the previous pastors that have been here. And, O oh Lord, we praise you for the heritage that's been given to us here. And ask, dear God, that we might be faithful to maintain it. Lord, that we'd be faithful to uphold the word in every, in every uh, action that we take. We ask, Lord, you'd bless those of our congregation who couldn't be here tonight for, uh, for the roads or for health or for whatever reason. Lord, has kept them away. Lord, that, Lord, we ask that these hindrances might be taken away. That they might be able to fellowship with us here when it's ours to gather again. And Lord, that we may enjoy the sweet fellowship that you've given us, and we praise you for it. Now, Father, we ask that you'd bless the song service, that as we lift up our hearts in song to you, that it would be pleasing in your sight, and Lord, that it be comforting to us, and Lord, that it be a testimony to our children and to the community around about us of the love that we have for you and the fullness of the Spirit that's here. Lord, evermore, Lord, let us be strong and let us be faithful to you. Forgive us when we fail you, O Lord. And help us, Lord, to be corrected and to walk in the ways that's most pleasing to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.